Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout Taylor. Our guest today is Lee Green. She is Vice President of Knowledge Creation at the Innovation Research Interchange, also known as IRI. Lee, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. So at Untold Content, we've been part of the IRI community for a little while now, and it's such an impressive community of innovators in, in manufacturing and in, uh, really across so many different industries. And you have a national event, you have several regional events throughout the year as well. And uh, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, IRI as a community of innovators? So yeah, IRI, we have about 150 different member companies. Um, we call them member companies, but they actually encompass uh, of, you know industry professionals and things like that, but also federal labs, you know NASA, DOE labs, things like that too. So it's a real mix of individuals. And what I always say is that although the results of innovation are different for most of our members, the processes that they use to get there are often very similar. And that's where we come in. We're able to help members to look at the different ways that they get to their products and help them to figure out ways of improving those processes. So whether it's finding the right talent or managing a portfolio of different projects or identifying those great ideas earlier and getting them to market faster. We try to help in all those different regards. And a key component of that is the the personal connections that we make. Um, you know, we, we hold live events, but we also enable people to network virtually. Um, we hold kind of discussion groups and things like that. And so we really want to be able to make those connections for people so that when they're facing a challenge, it's great if they come through us, but we think it's even better if they go to somebody that they met at IRI and at one of our events or in another way and, and are able to interact and communicate their challenges together and work together to help to solve them. Yes, I think knowledge sharing and knowledge creation, uh, hearkening back to your title, which, by the way, is an awesome title. Did you help come up with, <laughs> with that title? I did not. I, I didn't. But uh, but it is a nice one. Yes. And so, but, but I see knowledge sharing and knowledge creation uh, really at the heart of what all innovators should be doing. And so I uh, am really drawn to IRI's mission in that way. So can you tell us a little bit more about what it means to be the VP? of knowledge creation. <laughs> so I have two jobs, really. Um, and my overarching job is always making those connections, you know, providing good services for our members. That That's everybody's job at IRI. Um, but my main focus areas are on our strategic side and on our research side. So the strategic side is basically we look at the strategic environment in which innovation practitioners are doing their jobs. So what are those outside forces that are impacting how you're able to do innovation in your inside your organization? So we've done things like looking at the future of R&D, um, and that was a study to look at what R&D would look like 25 years hence. So when we did it, it was uh, for IRI 2038 is what we called it. So we came up with a series of narratives to help people explore what R&D could look like that far out. Um, wow. What, what, were some <laughs> of those, what were some of those trends? Um, oh, goodness. It was a few years back now, but uh, some of the more controversial ones were um, augmented humans. Um, so people would be augmenting themselves to be appropriate for a particular job. Sure. So, you know, whether that's implanting sensors within your, your hands and fingers so that you could uh, so you could sense what was going on on the on the factory floor or things like that, or um, whether it's taking some kind of medication to make you able to stay up later, you know, something minor like that. Um, so that was one of the, uh, the death of IP was another one that always kind of, whenever I gave the presentation, people would get kind of twitchy when I'd mention oh, that. I'm sure. But, you know, if you think about it, it basically our, our assertion there was that it was going to be um, speed to market would largely replace patents as the, 
means of getting value from things. So I think we're already starting to see that that trend in some in some industries and in some sectors. Yeah, certainly. It's a, it was it was a really interesting study, and some of it was way out there. We had four different scenarios that we came up with, and you know, whenever I'm reading the news now, and you know, this study is more than five years old. Oh gosh, it was seven years ago now. Um, and when still when I'm reading the news, I'm like, oh, that came true, or oh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that that's what's so interesting about uh future telling, right? <laughs> some <Yeah. laughs> some of those predictions will will happen and others won't, but at least we'll be um trying to think five steps ahead. Exactly. And the study itself was fascinating and it was great fun. But the challenge was that it was kind of so far out that our members couldn't really take that information and do much within their own companies. Right. Um, you know, some uh, there are organizations that do forecasting and they do it very well. You know, Chevron and um, Shell does a spectacular report on the future. And um, the U.S. Army, actually, they go 50 years out, which is mm. astonishing to me. Right. Um, I don't know how they're able to do that. Having done 25 years out, 50 years out just seems shocking. Um, but there are companies that do it and they do it very well. But because we were looking at R&D as a whole, it was kind of hard to be, it was even harder to be specific mm -hmm. than it is for when you're focusing just on oil and gas or or the military or something like that. Sure. So one of the key elements of your work is around research and what research we can conduct to better understand innovation processes and practices and, and what works and then how to produce managerial implications from that too, right? That's right. Yeah, that's the second half of my job. So that's my other hat. And, you know, my goal there is always to get members to coalesce around a particular challenge and get a core group of people from different industries. And I, I like to get, you know, different industries, different levels of seniority, and maybe even slightly different roles within their organizations. And then we work together to tackle that challenge and come up with recommendations that hopefully others can, they and others can implement within their organizations. I love the collaborative nature of what IRI is all about because I think historically anyway, uh, and, and still this is true, um, it, companies were a little less prone to interact or share their trade secrets or their IP. And uh, and I know that's still a concern and it's still carefully navigated for IRI members. Uh, but the fact that you exist and that so many incredible companies and organizations and public sector agencies participate, I think, lends a lot of hope to what's possible when you open innovation a bit and you uh, invite conversation and collaboration, especially around shared challenges. Yeah, it's, you know, it's hard to strike that balance. You know, one of our programs is the, the networks and those fo focus mainly on the different tactical areas of R&D. So we've got a network around um, intellectual property, which you know the irony isn't lost on us there. Um, also new business development, external technology, uh, things like that. And so they're focused on you know that particular element of how you get R&D done. And one of the most popular elements of those networks is they, they meet twice a year live. Um, and they, the first two hours of every meeting is a roundtable discussion. And it's when people can come together and they share their current challenges and they get feedback, live feedback from their peers on how they can attempt to tackle them. You know, whether it's just commiseration, like, oh yeah, we've got that problem too. Or it's, hey, we tried this, why don't you give it a shot? Or we tried this, it didn't work, so don't bother doing that one. Why don't you try this instead? And so that's always a very popular element of that program. And the challenge has always been to make sure that people feel comfortable in that space. And so people are always asking me, well, can I have the, the notes from that session? And we actually don't take any notes. We don't record it in any way because it's one of the, I always 
whenever I used to go to those meetings and I would introduce IRI and kind of lay the ground rules for the conference, I would say, well, it's like Vegas, you know, whatever happens at networks <laughs> stays in networks. And, you know, just to put people at their ease, you know, and I would say you're welcome to attribute the ideas to something you learned at IRI. We really want you to do that, but never say like, oh, I learned this from Joe Blow at, you know, Acme Corporation. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be very specific. And, you know, that program has been running for many, many years now, and I've never heard of a problem of somebody saying, hey, you got me in big trouble. You, you shouldn't have shared that. But uh, it's it's been wildly successful in that way. People feel safe. And that's a really that's something that's lacking in a lot of different areas now. Yes, it's so powerful. I, I want to linger on this idea a, little, a, a minute longer with you and and think about, in your opinion, I'd love to know what role, you kind of hearken to it already, but to me, this speaks so powerfully to the role that story sharing plays in innovation in particular, um, and, and some of the mental gymnastics that innovators have to go through as they come up with new ideas, you know, take them through different gates in their stage gate process and kill projects or shelve projects or move forward with projects, learn from failures, celebrate successes. They're so, it's such a, an emotional roller coaster type of work. And so the ability to share in a, in a more open and honest way about those challenges to me seems very powerful. And so tell me more about your, you know, your thoughts on story sharing across industries in that way. Yeah, as you say, it's it's very important and something that a lot of uh, there's a misnomer out there that scientists aren't able to explain to people, you know, lay people if you will, what they're doing. They're the people that I've interacted with at IRI are very passionate about their work and if you get them talking, it's often difficult to get them to stop. <laughs> and most of the time, they are able to share with me. And I have a social sciences background. So a lot of the stuff that they're doing is completely over my head. But they're able to share with me what they're doing. And so, but it's taken them a long time to get to that point. It's not something that people get training for, as far as I'm aware. It's not commonly trained for in organizations. That's a bad way of phrasing that. <laughs> sure. No, it's, I, people don't normally get that training during their educational processes. It's true. As it's far true. as I know. Right. I mean, so my personal background too, I'm a former research professor and have worked uh, in collaboration with different R&D stakeholders, leaders, and, and engineers, scientists. And in those roles, I saw that challenge again and again. And, and I've spoken with a lot of scientists and, and with other technical writing professors who analyze Analyzed the, the, those trends to see that most scientists really don't get very much communication and writing training, even though many of them are expected to publish really significantly. And um, through some IRI research, I recently learned, too, that in order to progress into leadership levels in their organizations, uh, they really need strong communication and writing and those interpersonal skills that are so important to being able to explain value and impact and uh, align the research efforts and the developments coming out with the larger organizational mission. So all of this work is so, I, I'm sorry, I, I already uh, I jumped in <laughs> to, what, to what you were saying, but I, I'm, I'm passionate that uh, this should be part of training, especially among individuals in the innovation community. Yeah, I agree. I think Part of the reason that the people that I'm seeing are so able to share with me in layman's terms what they're doing is that kind of self-selecting aspect of moving into those managerial roles. So the people who aren't able to communicate in that way often don't make it into the management side of things. And so they the people who are doing are staying on the scientific side, they are kind of they're moving on the fellowship track. So we often hear about dual ladders. And you know, there's, they've been changing that around a lot lately, there are more different types of ladders. But when I first began in this several, several years ago, um, 
there was a dual career track and it mm, was yeah technical. once you started that technical yeah the technical folks went on to become fellows or you could go on and move into the management track but what i think is so impressive to me about the people that i interact with through my job you know iris members is that the people who move to the management track, they don't use, they don't lose that scientific background. You know, they're still exactly. chemists and, and physicists and things like that, but they're also expected to have that management uh, acumen as well. And that's really challenging. You know, that's why these CTOs, it's so impressive what they're able to do because they have to understand the science behind what's going on so that they can understand, you know, how to get the, the products made and what the processes are, but they also have to be able to manage that entire process. And that's a serious spread of skills that are required of these individuals. Yes, yes. And I think the pressure is heavier than ever before for chief innovation officers or chief technology officers to not only manage their teams well and to still hold the technical knowledge and expertise, but also then to be able to take those findings and communicate them to the other C-suite leaders and the, you know, stockholders or other investors or shareholders or even consumers to be able to say, here's why you should trust that we are in fact innovative. And here's why you can believe that the, the, the projects that we're working on will matter. And so really having that skill of being able to market and explain and have thought leadership in those roles as CIO and CTO, I think it's, there's more pressure than ever before in those roles to, to be able to do that part too. Yeah, I agree. It's, we actually did a study not long ago on the path that individuals were taking to become the CTO or the the person who is the head of R&D and potentially innovation within an organization. And it was fascinating to me the very different paths that people were taking to get there. It almost was as if they needed to have this massive grab bag of experiences in order to get the role that they had. It was difficult to find areas that were similar across the board of all the individuals that we interviewed because there were just so many different things that they had all done that got them to that position. It was very surprising to me. Yes, absolutely. I, I think it speaks to how important it is to companies that those roles are embodied by individuals who are highly diverse and who really can speak across silos and across areas of interest in the organization and be able to, you know, I wonder too if it has something to do with uh, consumer demand for purchasing from companies that they perceive as being innovative. And so now innovation and technology, they really can't be boiled down to any one silo in the organization. They really have to permeate um, all that that we do. It's true. We see the this particular study as well. One of, the reason I was equivocating about the whole head of R&D versus CTO versus chief innovation officer is because so many different organizations are struggling to figure out how it all fits together. It's how do you integrate R&D and marketing and innovation and manufacturing and all of these things to ensure that, that you're innovative? And you know, do you just put a chief innovation officer at the top of all of them and assume it's going to trickle down? Uh, that, seems, <laughs> that seems a bit hopeful, but you, you just don't know. And so companies are trying to move things around. It, in my experience, they're, they're trying to figure out what the best fit is there. And it's very challenging. It is. And I think th- in the organizations that, that we've worked with in particular, I think the the ones where there's a lot of collaboration happening between sales and marketing and R&D, that tends to really help accelerate the ability of that organization to be perceived as innovative because the insights of their experts and their SMEs, if you will, are not left at the lab bench or only getting presented at scientific conferences. They're also getting pulled into thought leadership pieces that if marketing and R&D work really well together, they can create a relationship where 
they are marketing is helping R and D to translate their insights and establish thought leadership um, without losing the technical nuance uh, that makes you know their research accurate and evidence based and clear, but you know leveraging it in a way that. Uh, purchasers can understand and that really just different stakeholders can understand or stockholders. So that sort of collaboration, uh, I think, is more more important than ever. You know, it's funny because I'm actually trying to launch a project now and we've been really struggling to get it off the ground because it's called Encouraging Autonomy and Empowering R&D Teams. And one of the there were many different members who've kind of come and gone on this project. And that's part of the reason we're struggling to get it off the ground um, is because everyone seems to want a different piece. But one of the complaints that I've heard from that project is that marketing can sometimes, and this is obviously not always the case, and this was one individual's experience that they shared with me, but when R&D and marketing are combined, R&D can feel like they're almost lurching from one marketing and sales, not whim, but desire and, and push to the next. And r and is not necessarily able to push their own agenda and say, well, these are the things that we're able to come up with, or these are the, the innovations that we're working on, because they're almost being overshadowed by the demand that's being seen externally. And so there's this kind of push and pull between the two of them of how you get the right balance between getting input from sales and marketing, but also allowing innovators to to do what they do best, you know, come up with new ideas and come up with new technologies and giving them the independence and the freedom to spend some time, you know, whether that's, you know, skunk works or, you know, innovation time, as, as some organizations call it, to, to let them really explore and play and figure out what they want to do. And so it's so challenging when, yes, you want to break down silos, and yes, you want organizations to to be open and sharing information, but that other times they, they feel almost kind of piled on. You know, they, they feel like they're having to serve so many different masters that they're not able to accomplish and do what they do best. Oh, definitely. So it's so yes, hard. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's so hard. And another serious challenge is when marketing might want to expand or inflate a potential impact or claim in a way that R&D is not ready to articulate or that they are concerned about there being an evidence base for. And so there's there is a true there's a true challenge there in uh, not um, you know overselling and not only thinking about what like uh, the night the right spin right like data still matters the research still matters and you have to tell what is true and so that's a really another important really rule of play I think when we're talking about how marketing and R and D might play well together I, I actually haven't seen any organizations where they are combined is that what you were mentioning No no I haven't seen that at all but there there has I've heard of an instance where. Um, marketing was on top of I've, in a yeah way. I've seen that so too. chief marketing officer you know the VP of r and I can't remember what the structure was in this particular organization but there was marketing was R&D came under marketing somehow and yeah. uh, and that was very challenging I've seen yes I see what you mean and another <laughs> we're just listing challenges here to this whole <laughs> thing <laughs> don't give up <laughs> at the end of the day but <laughs> but yeah another challenge is um, really regarding time so for sales and marketing typically the most important and critical thing is the annual roadmap so that year's priorities whereas as the innovation team you're oftentimes being charged to think bigger than that and longer term than that. And so being able to, in, inside of enterprises where sales and marketing sort of rule uh, major decisions, being able to challenge, you know, as an innovation team, being able to challenge sales and marketing to um, really still champion and get behind innovative ideas that might not land on the annual roadmap, but they might land on the one that's two years from now. That can also be another challenge. But I think 
uh, confronting that and being clear that that they, you know, as an innovation leader, being open to understanding and empathetic that that I get that these ideas are longer term, um, but we really need your support as a champion and think of what could happen, uh, you know, in the short and long term if we were to to green light this particular idea or project. That's a, that's one piece of advice, I guess, for navigating that challenge. Yeah, it, it is very difficult. And I think the ability of uh, innovation practitioners, particularly those who've taken that management track that we mentioned, to be able to communicate and to explain what's going on and how the processes work and not use a bunch of jargon that's going to make people shut down and stop listening to you. <laughs> yes. is, that's very important. That's why there's that communication element that's so important for the people who end up taking the the management route. Yeah. T- tell us about some of the other research projects going on through IRI right now. Um, a particular favorite of mine that is coming out with an article hopefully fairly soon um, is Brilliant Failures. Ah, uh, uh, yes. I'm working on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can both I've, talk about I this I love one. that project. <laughs> I do, too. I do, too. I'm, I'm finalizing our, our revisions this week, actually. Oh, so, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Ready for resubmission. <laughs> oh, excellent. It's, it's just been such a fascinating project. And yeah. it was, it's amazing how much it has... The, the themes of that project are impacting the themes that I'm having on other projects as well. Because in order to have, in order to be comfortable failing, which let's face it, most people are not, especially high achieving individuals <laughs> who have worked you know, for years to get their PhD and yes. then to move into an organization. And, and so this is, these are people that that are used to doing well and to be able to say, I'm okay with the fact that this project failed, that's pretty significant. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a buzzword. People want to be able to feel comfortable failing and people want to hear about the fail cases and how people learn from their mistakes. But it's challenging because not a lot of people are willing to share that information. So it has to be very nuanced in how you approach it. And one of the roadblocks that we had with this particular project was identifying case studies. You know, case studies are a very important element in a lot of our projects. And being able to get eyes into three to five companies is very important to us. And it really helps to tell the story of this particular project and how these things work in those organizations. And so trying to get people to participate in a case study called Brilliant Failures was really hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, what kind of roadblocks did you come up against? The, the stigma? This, Yeah, very much the stigma. There were There was at least one company that just flat out said, we'll do it, but you got to change the name. And the project team was adamant. They said, we're trying to break down the stigma and we're keeping our name. So and admittedly, this was fairly far into the project. And so they were, they were pretty entrenched at this point. You know, earlier on, they might have been a bit more willing to change. But no, they stuck to their guns and they, they got their case studies. But it was, it was hard. It, it took longer than we thought. And it was challenging. But we, we got there in the end. And what I'm enjoying is a lot of the projects that I'm working on subsequently, this encouraging autonomy project that I mentioned, um, and a couple others on um, actually one on time to market slash speed to market. We're, we're kind of workshopping the name there a little bit. Um, Interesting. They, there's a lot on failure, but also kind of psychological safety. And, you know, because particularly with the encouraging autonomy one that I've mentioned, a lot of that is if you feel empowered, then you feel okay if you make an, if you make a mistake. You're not terrified that you're going to lose your job. And so feeling empowered is also the, it ties into, you know, being willing to take risks and being willing to accept that sometimes those risks aren't going to turn out well for you and being comfortable that you're probably still going to have a job after that happens. And so it's all that kind of psychological safety element. And so 
I've been sharing a lot of information from the Brilliant Failures project with other projects down the line because so much of it is, is so much of it is intertwined. Yes, one of, one of my favorite uh, moments from last year's IRI conference uh, when I, I went to the panel discussion uh, where they were presenting findings from the Brilliant Failures research. And one of the things they did in the beginning, uh, Jeff Bezos, of course, Amazon CEO, had just released his annual letter to shareholders. And in it, he said, you need to expect more failures from us this year, <laughs> because if we're going to have successes, you're going to see uh, not just more failures, bigger failures. <laughs> <laughs> is how he worded it. And and the research team shared that. And I remember the room just sort of, I, I think, was energized by that idea that, oh, we're, we're, we're in a new world now where um, there's an expectation for failure. And that, in, in fact, uh, they need, if you're not creating bigger failures, that may be a sign that you're not taking enough risks. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's very interesting and very challenging to get that mindset going in a company where you're not used to that. Um, we did a recent study on balancing risk in the R&D portfolio. And so much, so much depends on the culture around risk within an organization. If you feel that your company is willing to take risks, then you're more likely to feel that you can go ahead and try that different technique or that that new technology and things like that and and that's what leads to these next steps but also it's not just the culture and it's not something that management can snap their fingers and change you know it's a lot easier to take risks when you're making you know, a, an iPhone than it is when you're making a, a drug that people are going to be taking. Yes. So with, when you're in a heavily regulated industry, a lot of this is a moot point because, you know, <laughs> if you're yes, willing yes. to have a brilliant failure when you're working for GlaxoSmithKline, the stakes are a bit higher there. Right. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. In, in healthcare, medicine or in aviation, high reliability industries. Yes. You, the idea is to minimize risk and uh, but uh, I like this uh, this research that you're talking about where you're thinking of how to diversify our portfolio or certain projects may be higher risk and others are lower. Um, and, and then, of course, putting all those stop gaps in place to protect against catastrophic failures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And organizations do. Obviously, you know, stage gate is is pretty ubiquitous at this point. Um, you know, people have obviously modified it many times over the years and things like that. Um, but it is, a lot of it is very dependent on what kind of culture is within the organization and what, what kind of culture is coming in from outside to the, you know, the, the regulations and, and things like that, that companies have to face. What other advice could you share for the innovation community as they prepare to uh, communicate and, and share and build upon their great ideas? Um, I think I'm, I'm going to have to be a little self-serving here and say that they really need to collaborate. Hearing other people's input is really valuable and, and learning from those who have come gone before you, but also learning from people who are new to a relative relatively new to a field and have a bit more of a different background than you and that's what i really like about what iri does is we're able to bring people together who are from lots of different industries and yet they're able to find those commonalities and it helps them to get perspective and to see things from a different through a different lens and that can really help to you know, make your work better and make your work easier. If you've got people that you can call on and bounce ideas off of, that saves you time in the end. And it also helps to give you new ideas. And that's what we really are trying to do at IRI is to give people an easy access to building that network of people that you can bounce ideas off of because it's really helpful. I mean, just if you think about you know, in your professional life, you know, you want to get input from other people, but 
if you do that, you know, when you have a challenge just in your personal life, you ask people questions, you say, hey, what happened here? It's the same professionally. You, you want to get different perspectives so that you can examine an issue from all the different angles and go forward and get a better solution. Yes, I couldn't agree more. And, uh, you know, I've personally, of course, so invested in that idea and am so honored to be part of the IRI community. Uh, and I'm grateful that you made the time today. I, I hope listeners will check out the Innovation Research Interchange. You can follow them on social media at IRI Web. And of course, Lee Green, I am so grateful to get to talk knowledge and research uh, collaboration with you today. Thank you for being on the podcast. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. 